Welcome everybody to our slip stitch knitting class on this Monday afternoon. My name's Claire. I'll be hanging out in the chat with you all, answering questions there or forwarding, forwarding them on to Darren. So if you do have any questions during the course of class, just type them in the chat. I'll also put the handout in there as a PDF and as a link in case, in case you didn't get that earlier. And like we said, this class is being recorded. So if you have to leave or you need to watch things over again, you can do that once the recording has been posted. And now that all of that is taken care of, we'll hand it over to Darren. Okay, welcome to class. Uh, today, we are going to have a very gentle introduction to slip stitch knitting. And um, slip stitch knitting is really um, interesting technique. You can do um, something like this, which is the linen stitch, all in one color and just create a really nice and fun um, texture. It's actually reversible. This is actually the back, but I really like that because it looks like seed stitch. And then that's the front of the linen stitch. Very nice. Or you can do like a really simple uh, design like this where you have the purple stripe that runs vertical and creates a new design. Um, also, a little more complicated, but still really easy, um, something like this. So this is really fun. It's a fun look. And we, you can accomplish all of these um, with just a little practice, and it's not so hard. So um, don't be intimidated by it when you first look at it. So if we want to go ahead and switch the view to the view of my hands, I'll go ahead and start, start with the instructions. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the handout. I don't know if everybody realizes it, but um, the hand, the original handout that was probably attached to your email, we found some um, few typos in it. So we had a new handout that Claire created. She corrected it today. And so this section here where it says two color slip stitch with stranding on the public side, that's new. Um, it replaced an old one, which had several typos in it. So we, we didn't want to let that go. So we found that, so we corrected it. So if you have the old handout, um, the old handout, um, I crossed mine out. Um, it says the same thing with decorative effect, but it does, um, it comes from the fallen leaves scarf pattern. So if you are looking at the one that says um, fallen leaves scarf, pattern that that one has um, some very bad typos in it which made it so it wouldn't work at all so this is the new one um, scarf number l20680 is the correct one so um, you can probably download that from the chat and then reprint it if you need to so i just want to make sure we got that out of the way so today i'm going to be demonstrating with i'm using um hometown in Oakland Black and in, I think it's Houston, this beige is Houston, I think is what it is. But um, these are both available on michaels.com or lionbrand.com. And the reason I'm using these today is because I like to um, demonstrate with this big yarn because it's easy for the students to see what I'm doing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about slip stitch knitting just to get started. So slip stitch knitting uses unworked stitches to create texture or color in a design. So um, instead of knitting those stitches, you're just slipping them unworked. Um, slipped stitches are stretched over two rows of knitting, making the fabric more dense and more compressed vertically. So you might want to go up a needle size. You might want to go up two needle sizes. If you're making a garment or something that needs to be an exact size, this is a good idea to do a gauge swatch because your gauge will be much different than what it usually is. So if you're usually loose or tight, this is going to affect that. So this, this is a situation where a gauge swatch might really come in handy. Um, um, the two main things to pay attention to, and I'm going to go over this as we practice, um, the stitch mount. So you don't, I don't know if you know about twisted stitches. You do not want to get twisted stitches, um, and it's the way you enter the stitch, either knit-wise or purl-wise, which will be very important. So for slip stitch knitting, like 99% of the time, you will always be entering your stitch purl-wise, but 
there's always an exception. So, you know, I don't want to say never, but like almost always you'll be slipping your stitches purlwise. And then the float placement is also very important. When you're slipping your stitches and carrying that color past the stitches that you did not work, you'll be creating a float. And that will um, either be a decorative effect or it'll be hidden on the back. So there are two ways that you can um, use the float. You can use it as a decorative feature or you can hide it. So, so right here, if you're slipping a stitch, slip one, it's abbreviated like this, S1. And that would be the same if it were slip two, slip 10, whatever. So it's just SL and then the number of stitches you'll be slipping. Um, this is probably new for you. Slip one with yarn in front is abbreviated S-L-W-Y-I-F. Slip yarn with yarn in front. And again, this number could, could change. It could be three, it could be four. It's usually not more than five though. I think five is what usually is the, the largest number. And then slip one with yarn in back is abbreviated um, with the same, but with a B. So slip one with yarn in back. So that's what it looks like in a pattern as you'll be working it. And we're gonna look at what creates the difference in that. So just do we have any questions at all before we get into it? How everyone feels pretty good about getting started? I think we're good so far. Okay. So this um, swatch here that I have laid out is the first exercise on your sheet and it's called a simple stripe with two colors. And this is done um, multiples of six plus one. So what we're using is um, we're casting on 17. So we're going to use, um, I'm using, this is what I'm going to be using today. So row one, I've kind of got a head start. So row one is knit. I you know, cast on with my black. I did a knit and I did a purl. Um, I did row one and row two with my beige color. And uh, row three, we're gonna start with our second color. So it tells us to, you look here, knit five, slip one, repeat from the asterisk till the end and you'll be ending with a knit five. So um, it just says slip one. So it's not telling us to slip one with the yarn in the front or the yarn in the back. So right, right on the very start, we're having problems and we're having questions. So if it says to slip one, what that means is you're gonna slip yarn, holding the strand of yarn where it was after you completed your last stitch. So that's gonna make a big difference if you're knitting or purling. So if you're knitting, you'll hold the yarn in the back. And if you're purling, you hold the yarn in the front. That's correct, right, Claire? You got it. Sometimes I say things backwards. You have to watch me very close. Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna knit five with my black. Make sure yarn get tangled up. Oops, sorry. And also you wanna just, you don't wanna cut your yarn with each stripe. So you're just gonna carry the yarn gently up the side. So this black is from the bottom stripe. I'm just gonna gently carry it up the side. And usually you can hide that in a seam or if you're making a scarf, it usually looks all right on the edge. So I'm gonna knit five, just like normal knitting. Let me get this out of the way in case it gets distracting. One, two, three. four, five. So knit five and then slip one. So I've been knitting. My yarn is in the back, so I'm not going to change the orientation or the placement of my yarn. I'm entering this stitch. I'm entering this stitch as if to purl. So I'm going to enter the stitch as if to purl and just transfer it right over. Now the important thing is is I'm not changing the way that the stitch is positioned. So this strand of yarn right here is the front leg. And when I transfer it over, it remains the front leg. Now watch what happens if you slip it as if to knit. 
So this leg's gonna turn around and end up on the back and that's gonna cause a twisted stitch. So you, you don't want that. Um, someday it might say, you know, slip it as if to knit, but if it wants you to slip it as if to knit, it will tell you that. So we're gonna enter the stitch as if to purl and then slip it. And that's all there is. That's all there is with slipping the stitch, just slip it right over and then repeat from the asterisk across. So I'm gonna knit five again with my black. Just normal knitting. Enter the stitch as if to purl and just transfer it over. So easy. And then knit, finishing with a knit five. Any questions at all? I'll be glad to take many questions as you have. I was going to mention Darren knits normally with the yarn in his left hand, but knit with it in your right hand, however you usually knit. Yes, I knit kind of a weird way, but that's that's how God made me, so that's how it is, I guess. So, all right. We do have Let's, a question about how you would add that contrast color at first. Okay, well, I can show that. Um, grab another color. So I've got this one handy. So I'm going to add this color just for pretend. We're not really going to keep it. So don't think this is part of the pattern. Um, so I've got this kind of beige with this tweed in it. And so adding a color is easier than you think. And people want to make it a complicated situation, but it's really not. So I'm going to hold this working yarn. Um, I'm going to save a tail for weaving in later for finishing. And I'm going to hold that tail just on the back of my work. And then I'm gonna hold the working yarn where I need it to be for my next stitch. So if it were attached to my yarn, it would be right here. If it was attached to my project, it would be right here. So if you were doing a knit, you would just enter the stitch, wrap the new yarn and bring it through and then continue on. You just don't knit with the tail by mistake. So there's really nothing to do. There's nothing really to see. So you're just adding it. Um, sometimes people will say you should knit, knit the new yarn and the old yarn together for a couple of stitches, or people will come up with a lot of different ideas and it's all unnecessary and can cause problems. If you're gonna start it out with a purl, again, just hold your tail for finishing and out of your way, just hold it out of the way, uh, position your yarn for a purl, enter the stitch, wrap your yarn, bring it through, and now it's attached for the purl. So depending on, and just don't knit with your tail by mistake. And then after you finish the row, you might wanna secure that tail a little bit because, because it's not attached to anything, it can work out, um, sometimes slip out and cause your work to unravel. So you might wanna go ahead and weave that in or just tie it in a, like a nice tight little bow um, to the other tail that's close to it. Does that answer that? Answer that question? Okay, so the next row, so I worked one row across on my knit side, and then the next row, row four, um, with color two still, so I'm using the black again, I'm going to purl five, and then slip one and repeat across. So it's going to end up being a stocking and stitch situation. Um, you can do garter, you can do slip stitch knitting with garter stitch or stocking it. Now here's a little trick to help keep things a little easier. Um, whenever you're doing slip stitch knitting, you tend to knit two rows um, with the same uh, color. And you tend to, then you're gonna, when you come to a stitch that was slipped, you're just gonna slip that same stitch. And that's what creates it being stretched over two rows. So you really don't have to even refer back to your pattern. You should look at it just to be sure you're in the right place. But when you start the row, if you forget what you're supposed to be doing, all you have to do is just work those stitches. See, I'm working the black stitches, I'm purling them because I'm doing stockinette stitch. And then when I get to the white stitch, I know, ha ha, that was a slip stitch. So I just enter it as if to purl and then slip it. So it, the second row is a little break. So if the first row was complicated, then the second one 
you can kind of take a break and relax and just kind of work with there. So, Question about the slip stitch on this row. Also, you're sort of running off the bottom of the camera oh, there. Sorry. Um, Jane had a good question that when you're working in stockinette and you're coming back across your purl row, are you slipping those stitches as if to knit or as if to purl? Always, 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 99% of the time, as if to purl. It would be an unusual situation if they wanted you to do it as if to knit. So just remember that. Um, the only time I know you really do it as if to knit is when you're doing an SSK or sometimes in a like a twisted rib, they'll have you do it as if to knit. But like 99% of the time, it's as if to purl. If they want you to do it as if to knit, it'll usually say as if to knit. Okay. Man, we, have, we have a question about why you have that uh, giant kilt pin on there. Okay. And it is, it's a kilt pin. I do like my kilt pin. So I did that as a, like a teaching crutch. So sometimes when you start off on a new um, technique, you might have a hard time realizing what's the front and what's the back. So with this swatch, it's pretty easy because it's, you've got, it's all stockinette stitch. So once you get a couple of rows in, you can see the front and the back fairly clearly. But sometimes when you're just getting started or Well, isn't stuck in a stitch. And so maybe a couple of rows in, you're not sure what's going to be the front or the back. Um, you can put a pin or something just to mark it, um, just to kind of help you remember. So I just put that there just so that I would be able to remember to tell you guys that's, I always like a little crutch, anything to make it easier so that you don't get confused. I'm all for that. Okay. Any other questions? We do have a question about carrying the unused color up the side of the work. Okay, I'm gonna be doing that right now. So referring back to our pattern, um, I did row three and then I purled. So now I'm going back, it says repeat rows one and, repeat um, these four rows one or two more times, depending on however you wanna practice. So I'm gonna go back up to row one and I will show you how to carry it up the side. So the way I do it, and you can jump in clear if you do it differently. I usually start my stitch as if I'm going to um, just go ahead and knit and then just bring this up. And then the only difference is, is you don't wanna pull it so tight. So you just carry it up the side, um, go ahead and start doing your stitching. And maybe after you do two or three, it might not be a bad idea to stop and just kind of just give it a gentle little snug like that so that if you pulled it tight, now's the chance for you to kind of massage out if, if it's, ten you don't want it to pucker. If you pull it really tight, it'll cause it to squish together really badly. So just kind of give it a little, just let it, let it breathe a little. And then that's all you do to carry it up the side. And so for this row, I'm just knitting the whole row. So it's kind of a boring row. But as I'm and doing since, that, we have, what? I was gonna say, since these are only two row stripes, the unused color, do you have to do anything special to that? What do you mean? I don't know what the- so Like when you, when you switched from black to white, the black yarn is, are you doing anything special with that? Nope, it's just waiting its turn. It's just hanging out over there, waiting its turn. Is there something I should be doing special with it? No, not for this particular pattern. Um, okay. Since we're only doing the two rows, the yarn really isn't being carried that far up the side. If you were going to be working, and you wouldn't be working this in slip stitch, but if you were doing like four or six rows of a color, then you could sort of loop the other one up the side. But that won't ever be happening in slip stitch because then you won't have yarn to slip the stitches with. Mm -mm. No. Okay, so I'm going to purl back um, and then I can work one more row of this one. And if we have any questions as I'm purling, it's a good time for questions. If, has anyone done slip stitch knitting before or is this brand new to everyone? Looks like we've got mostly new people here, a couple that have done it before. Okay. 
It's a good way to, to do color work if you're an intimidated by fair aisle, which is much easier than it looks, so don't be intimidated by it. But if you are, um, this might be a nice way to add some color work to your projects without um, trying to take on anything too complicated. All right, so now you can see this is shaping up. Um, it kind of creates this vertical stripe and then it breaks the black up into, instead of black stripes, now it's like little black rectangles. So it almost looks like bricks. You could stagger this. Um, this pattern is not staggered, but you could stagger it to make it make the next row, the white stripes could come here, like here, here, and here. And then that way it would look like brick, like a brick wall. So that could be really cute on a scarf or something. But that's not what we're doing today. So, but I always like to point out ideas. So I'm going to take the black and I'm going to gently carry it up the side. And I'm going to enter the stitch. I'm going to knit five, one, two, three, four, five. And then you can kind of see what you're supposed to do. That's where I'm going to slip my stitch. And then one, two. And this is just normal knitting. That's why I'm going fast, trying to. Five, so knit five. And it's not a bad idea every now and then to kind of give your work a little snug like this so that you're not getting it too tight with this. So this one, you, we're only having a two slip stitches, so it wouldn't be so bad. But if you have a lot of slip stitches, you might just want to give it a gentle little snug. And then enter it as if to purl. And then just transfer it right over. Nothing special, nothing fancy. And then end with knit five. How is that making everybody feel? And then after we practice and keep going, then I did a garter stitch edge on this one so that it would lay flat, but um, so this is exactly what I'm doing. If I turn this edge under, that's how it looks. I did the edge garter stitch edge so it would lay flat and look nicer for the for the video. All right. Any so no questions about that? Here's how it looks in a green. So you can see by changing the color, you, it changes the mood quite a bit of your color work. Oh, and I do want to touch on this. When you're selecting your colors, it's very important that you select colors that are gonna, you're gonna be happy with. So if you want something more subtle, um, I felt like this green and yellow would like really be bold and stand out because green and yellow, but I feel like, I feel like it's not as bold as I wanted it to be. Whereas this black and white is, is far more striking and like the purple and white is far more striking. So if you wanted to give a lot of nice contrast, um, two ways of doing that is, one way, if you just squint your eyes like really tight, like almost closed, and if you look at them and they they kind of blend together, then you know there's not contrast. Or if you take a picture with your phone and then change it to black and white, and if it looks like the same shade of gray in the picture, not good contrast. So, um, and if you want it to be really subtle, that that's how you can tell if it's going to be subtle or not. So depending on what you want for your end result. But that's just Sometimes you can be very disappointed um, when you put colors together that they might not look the way you thought they were going to look. So that's kind of some ways. Do you have any tricks for that, Claire? I think those are both good tips for that. All right. So move, this one's fun. Isn't this cute? Wouldn't you love to have a sweater? You could do the yoke out of this, and then the rest of it could just be smooth, right? Or a scarf. It's going to be super cute. I like that one. It's pretty easy. So let's look at the pattern. So this is the new one that we added to the new handout. So this one, um, it's two color slip stitch with stranding on the public side for the decorative effect. So with this one, I have my slip stitches on the public side, but my strands are all on the back. So you don't, and they're kind of, that's my strand or my slope. Um, so they don't affect the front, but this one, 
that's what these little loops are. And I think it almost looks like, like loops or like little curly cues or something. I think it's super cute, but that's what creates that on the public side. Um, it's a two color pattern, uh, multiples of two stitches plus one. So if you wanted to do this on, like you say, you just wanna make a scarf, you could cast on two multiples of two. So any even number you could cast on 20 um, plus one. So you'd cast on 21. So you could make, you can kind of design your own by knowing that. So um, figure out how many stitches you want, maybe just a little, just a few to practice, but then more for a scarf or something. And again, we're gonna carry the color we're not using up along the side. Um, so the first row, um, they're telling you now it's the right side. With, with the first color you're gonna knit, row two, with the first color you're gonna purl. And here, working swatch. Oh no, I didn't. I got something else here. So for the first one, you knit and purl. And so I've set myself up here to start the pattern again. So if you just look at these two rows here, this is one row of knit and one row of purl. Okay, so one row of knit and one row of purl. And then rows three and four with the second color. You're gonna knit one, slip one with the yarn in the back, knit one and repeat to the end of the row. So again, just gently carrying it up the side without stretching it or distorting the fabric. Just very gently, just go ahead and bring that up. Just don't pull it. Let me refer back to my pattern. So rows three and four with the second color, knit one, and then slip one with the yarn in the back. So my yarn is already in the back because I'm knitting, so it's ready to go. And I'm gonna slip one with the yarn in the back. So I have to enter as if to purl and slip one and then knit one. and then slip one. So the part here that you gotta pay attention to is I'm knitting, so I'm entering as if to knit, and then I'm entering and slipping as if to purl. So it's every other one. It's almost the same motion as if you're working ribbing. So just kind of think of it that way, but you don't wanna, so I knitted and now I'm slipping. It's sometimes easy to do that but you wanna make sure you're slipping as if to purl. And my float, you can't really tell what I'm doing necessarily, but my float is in the back. Um, if I, my float was in the front, it would look like this. Sorry, and then you would get this um, line across the front, but I'm doing it with my float in the back. So my float in the back. So slip one, knit one, all right, so we worked all the way across that row. And basically what you end up with is every other stitch. Okay. So now I'm gonna turn my work and I'm, because I worked, I was knitting with my white, I'm gonna be working with my white on the way back. And so this is telling us, so rows three and four are exactly the same. Rows three and four are listed the same. So with the second color, so continuing with white, knit one and then slip one, knit one with yarn and back. So it's the same thing. And you notice I'm knitting, I'm not purling. This is not stockinette. So we're doing something a little different. So knit one and slip one again with my yarn in the back because I'm knitting. So enter it as if to purl. But what this does, because I'm slipping it, I'm on the wrong side of my work and I'm slipping it with the yarn in the back, that's putting these floats on the front of my work. So if you turn it over, here's the front of my work. This float is gonna be stretched over this purple stitch, creating that extra texture right there. Sorry, I'm off the edge. So it's gonna be stretched across this purple stitch, creating that texture. 
too. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? No questions? No questions. And again, I don't have to look, I don't have to look at my pattern. I'm set up. I know I'm knitting the white stitches and slipping the purple stitches because I'm working with white. We're slipping the purple, knitting the white. So the second pass, the second row um, is easy to follow. You don't have to really concentrate too much. Now let's look at it. So I get my two, my two rows of purple, which was just worked in stockinette stitch. And then I get my two rows of white um, and they were worked in garter stitch because I knitted both sides. Um, and I worked two rows of the white, but I'm still getting these purple stripes or these purple every other stitch. Uh, and that's what's creating my slip. That's kind of what creates these little, um, little stitches kind of peeking out from the other. So any questions how I got that or any, everyone? must be an advanced group everybody i think everyone's still enchanted with this pattern and we had a lot of people commenting they liked the swatch isn't it cute i really like this one this is the one you oh. found claire kind of found this one at the last minute on the 11th hour and i think she did an excellent job someone really has a like good it. comment it looks like uh like fancy icing like on a gingerbread house or something oh yeah could be yeah you could do it brown and white and then that would look like a gingerbread house right Holidays are coming up, so. Okay, so any questions about this swatch at all? Because if we're ready to move on, I think we're gonna work on a crossword puzzle next. So do you wanna take a break and work on a crossword puzzle? Is that what this is, Claire? Is this a crossword puzzle? Uh, that is not a crossword puzzle, sir. Oh, we do have a good question. Um, can we do slip stitch knitting in the round? Absolutely. Um, I've not done slip stitch knitting in the round. Have you done it? I have done a little bit, yes. Um, and it's basically the same as we've been demonstrating, but if you're working in stockinette, instead of um, purling on your way back, you would just be knitting that second row because you're always looking at the right side of your fabric. The pattern would tell you that. The designer would have figured that out, right? Yes, yes. They do try to figure things out for us in advance. All right, so this this is not, I'm not good at crossword puzzles anyway, so I'm actually kind of relieved because it's not a crossword puzzle. So what that is going to give us is a swatch or a design that looks like this. And you could work, you could work this design into the uh, panel of a sweater, or you could make a bunch of these and with other designs and you could sew them together and make an afghan. Um, you could make a scarf and just keep repeating the same design as you're knitting um, and make a scarf. So there's lots, lots of fun things. And once you know how to read the chart and follow this chart, then there could be lots, lots of other designs that you can find and you could do all different ones and make a really fun project. And so this is the gold and the green, which I felt was gonna be very striking and a lot of contrast, but as you can see, like this black and white is much more noticeable. So it's kind of a lesson to be learned, like the side. I still think this is pretty though. I do like it, but you know, for the extra work you're doing, you may as well get a little more bang for your buck. So um, double check your color choices before. And that's when a swatch also comes in really nice. Like before you start a big project, um, do a little swatch to make sure that the colors are working together. So sometimes that's the benefit of it. Okay, so let's look at this chart and talk about it. So I don't know if anyone has followed a chart before, but whenever you're following a chart, um, the first thing you wanna look at are where are the numbers and what is the number system? Because that tells you what order to work the swatch, to work the chart in 
and also which direction to work it in. So I'm starting here because it's number one is right here. So if I start here, the only direction I can go is this direction. Um, usually, however, there would the number two would be up here and then you would go back. And then the number three, so usually when you're reading a chart, you're going like this, kind of in a zigzag. So this is new. So if you're, if you're new to slip stitch knitting, this is a new way of looking at a chart. So there's always something new to learn. So that's why I always say, look for the numbers and they will guide you. So number one, I'm gonna work across all in white. And then number two, starting here with number two, I'm gonna go back across working in white. So I worked one, I worked two, I'm gonna go up to three. And it's telling you here, the first um, block, this color is black. So I'm gonna be knitting with black and slipping with the other one. So I'm gonna leave the white behind, knit with black, slip, and then knit, and then slip, and then knit, and then slip, and then knit, and then I'm over here. I'm ready to start row four. And row four, I'm just gonna go back across and I don't even have to look at my chart because I'm gonna knit the black ones with my black and I'm gonna slip the white ones going all the way back across up to number five, to number six, back across now to number seven. Any questions about reading the chart? Because this is a new way to read a chart if you've not looked at this before. And then if, if you were working in the round, I've never seen a chart for working in the round because it's working in the round where they just clear, would they just have the chart repeated up just like each line doubled so it could be all the numbers on the one side or how would that work in the round could we think? I think that's how I've seen it done where basically you have a duplicate of each round going up and so the chart would be twice as tall and look a little funny. Actually I don't think it would look funny I think it would look because the this says that the chart looks exactly like the fabric you create. It represents the public side of your work, which I don't think is accurate because to me, this looks kind of short and squatty, but your finished piece is more kind of, it's more raised vertically. It's almost more square where this is short and squatty like a short rectangle. Don't you think that would be, if, if the chart was listed, I don't know, it, it's hard to say. But I thought that that looked a little short and squatty. So, so the main thing about the chart, everything else we've already talked about is exactly the same, except um, the only new bit is how to read the chart. So if you do decide you have a question, please let me know. All right, so I worked, um, I started into this chart a little bit, and now I'm ready to start with my um, purple again. Nope, I'm sorry, I'm starting with my white because my white stitches are slipped. Oh, make sure you get your yarn in the right position. We do have a couple questions coming in here. Okay, good. Um, I think there's perhaps it's a little intro paragraph. Um, mosaic knitting, you can do it either in stockinette stitch like you've shown or in garter stitch, right? Absolutely. This is not, this, I mean, this is with garter stitch and the create, so it does give a new, like, an, like this is stockinette stitch and garter, but you can see if we did it in garter, um, it creates this bridge. And depending on the placement of the float, you might have them on the public side or not, but it would create that, those pearl ridges. Um, could, it's very simple. Maybe it looks better one way, maybe it looks better the other way. So depending on the look that you want. Anything else? And I think specifically with that chart there, if you were working your uh, all in garter stitch, and so you're also knitting the other rows, then you kind of would get just one line of that dark purple. It would be a little ridge on your right side. And it would probably be a little more short and squatty. Like and it would be a little bit more squat, correct? Yeah. Yes. yes. So depending on the and, look that you want. Oh, we do have another question. Um, just a review as you're starting this row, how you know um, which color to knit and which color to slip as you're following right, so the that's chart. That's a good question because I started to say the wrong color. 
So it is a good idea. Like if you, I might started this earlier this morning and then I put it aside um, for class. So I didn't really remember which color I ended with. So it's a good idea to go ahead and lay your work out and examine it. So my white, my cream color is down here. And my purple one is up, up, up here. So you can tell that I just knit my last stitch with purple. And because I'm on the stockinette stitch side, I know I knitted across and then purled back with the purple because the purple is connected to my needle right up here. Does that make sense? Can you see? If you look at your working yarn, the purple is the one you can see I just knitted with that and the white is down here. So it's been resting, left behind. Does that answer that question? I think so. And just as you're getting ready to start, what row are we going to be following along with? Okay. So I did my white. I did um, this purple row. I did three, and then I went back on row four. And now I'm ready to start row five. And because the square is white here, that's indicating I should be knitting with the white in this chart. <clears throat> so I'm going to have two white, and I'm going to slip a purple, three white, slip a purple, three white, slip a purple. Okay. Follow up on that on the chart, the little single columns to either side. I think you've knit them in there as a teaching aid, but typically that is just telling you what color of yarn to use. And so you wouldn't be knitting those actual stitches but there's maybe just a hint of a bold line around the motif in the middle and that's what you're going to be knitting the little columns on the side are just going to tell you what color of yarn to use for that row you know claire that's what i thought but it says to work with 17 stitches and if you count them then these are included in that 17. so i felt like hmm. that's what i felt like that's why I say with this chart, I mean, maybe they want that for some reason as part of a decorative feature. But I, I think you are probably more correct than the chart is because I feel like that's kind of a just, well, you know, it could be if you repeat this chart like 10 times on a, the front of a sweater or something and you have this dotted line in between each motif, that could be cute too, right? Or not, I don't know. It could be, yeah. So, Depends on what you're going for. Yeah. So it just depends. But yeah, that's what I thought. But then I counted them and it said, and it was 17. So that's what I went with. So anyway. Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna my, my mistake. I thought we also had written directions for this, but we only have the chart for this particular motif. Yeah. And that was my original thought though, was that that was just for guidance, but it seems like it is they want, I don't know, who knows. Okay, so I'm gonna knit two, carrying the white up the side. You might want to stop and just give it a little little snug to make sure you didn't pull it tight. This is the time to double check, not five rows up. Okay, so knit two and then slip the purple. So leaving the purple behind out of the way, slip, enter it as if to knit. So slip the purple, knit three with the white. And knit three with the white and then slip the purple. And you know you're off. I mean, this is a good time to check and see. Sometimes you can tell if you're off track. So instead of knitting three, if I messed up and I knitted four, and now it's telling me to slip a purple and I don't have a purple, then you know something's gone wrong. You might want to go back and count. So one, two, three. Whoops, I knitted four, unknit it, slip my purple. So if it's not adding up, if it's not matching up right, sometimes sometimes it will seem like it's matching up, but sometimes it's not. So, um, and then, and again, like here, it's telling me to knit three white and I have three white, and then I'm gonna slip a purple. So that's kind of lining up, it kind of looks like what I'm doing. Slip the purple, refer to your chart. Knit three white. So enter it as if to knit. 
I'm sorry, as if to curl. And then finish with two knitted white. And then it's not a bad idea to lay out your work, look at it, and kind of see if it's looking, if anything looks crazy, now's the time to catch it, right? So now I worked all the way across. I'm on row six, I'm gonna work back. But guess what? I don't even need the chart because I'm just going to, and I'm working stock and stitch, so I'm gonna be curling. I'm just gonna work all the white stitches. So curl the white stitches and flip the purple one. So when you come to the purple, you know you're just slipping them. I'm sorry, I keep going off the edge. So just enter as if to curl and slip it over. So the second pass is quite easy. You're just following what's already there. That is the nice thing about this technique is that you sort of get like a little rest row after you've finished that first one. Yeah, so if it's, if it's more complicated or complex or hard to keep track of, then you get a break. So it's nice to get, a, I like to have a break. So I'm not even looking at the chart. I don't even have to refer to it. Um, the stitches are telling me exactly what to do. And this is just normal knitting and purling back. Nothing, nothing to learn. And that's the good thing about most things in knitting. Um, we always think of it if it's like fair aisle or cables or something that there's, it looks really incredible. So there must be like all this crazy new knowledge happening. But most of the time it's, just a few little things here and there, but the rest of it isn't so hard. So you can kind of see how that's shaping up and that looks kind of complex. If I showed you this before class and said, this is super easy, probably would have been, yeah, like, yeah, right. It must not be, but um, it is pretty easy, right? So, you know, give it a try and see how you like it. Any questions at all about the chart? Because that's a little confusing when you don't know. Say you've stopped for the day and you put it down. What's a good way that you keep track of your the row you finished on or the row you start? Well, I just finished five and six. Check it off. So I've done one and two. I've done, I've done one, three, and five. So I'm going to start on seven. I don't know. Is that a good way? How do you do it? Yeah, I usually either cross off rows on the chart or I have a... Um, like a separate mechanical row counter that you can click. Some people in the chat say they're using post-it notes or you know, you can get highlighter tape. So yeah, I do I I still have a post-it note handy, but I do love a post-it note. Um and you can just stick it right in place. And then that way you can you're only looking at the row. And sometimes I'll stick one above. So that way I'm blocking up everything. And then you do move, you just move it up as you go. And that's a good yeah. way. Um, it's a good way to practice though, to like, let's say you forgot to mark it off or feel like, did I mark it off or didn't I? I don't remember. Um, but you look at it, two white, one purple, three white, one purple. And then you kind of see where does that match up? Like, you know, you weren't up here. So, you know, three white, one purple, three white, one, you can kind of, you know, figure it out that way. You know, three white, one purple, three white, one purple. You can kind of like count it across ending with two white. So you see how I did that? Just kind of see which one matches up to it. Or you can count. So one, two. So any questions? Uh, we do have another good question. Is the cast on row counted as the first row in the chart? I'm, I didn't count it as the first row. Would you, Claire? I think that depends on the project or if you're designing what you want the look to be like. So yeah. like in your swatch there, the purple border at the bottom is slightly thicker than mm -hmm. the next two purple rows. I don't think that would bother me, but if you want it to be absolutely even, then you could count that first row as row one of the chart. Yeah. So 
if I mean, this is just an exercise. This is just a chart, just freestanding all on its own. Chances are you're not going to knit this chart freestanding all on its own because, I mean, it's not such a useful project. Um, what you're normally going to run into is maybe you've been, you know, say, cast on 17 stitches, knit three rows, or like knit two inches of ribbing, um, knit one row in main color, um, and then the next row will say work chart starting with row one. And it'll, that's what it usually will tell you, like work chart uh, the next row. And then, so <clears throat> it doesn't matter what you did before the chart, now you're starting the chart. So that's, that's usually how charts work. Usually they're inserted into a pattern. They're not just like a, a chart. I mean, it's not so, like if you made this, you know, again, unless you were gonna sew them together and make them into squares, but still if it were a, if it were a blanket with this, made in squares, it would tell you, you know, either start directly with chart or um, it would probably have you knit a row or before. Right, Claire, is that how it usually would be worded? It would usually tell you? Yeah, and I think in most cases, if you're doing, you know, a garment or a scarf or mittens or a hat or anything, you do have a little bit of a border, like for, you know, ribbing in a neckline or at the bottom of a hat, so. Yeah, but again, not always, never, everything is never always. In there. Exactly. There, there, will, there will be an exception. As soon as you say something is always a certain way, there'll be an, somebody will come up and say, how about this? And then there will be. So, how, any other questions about anything we've covered today? Anything we do. Um, Pat wants to know, what do you do after two rows is slipping and it shows it needs to be done two more times? Um, and that's probably where you should be changing color. Because if you yeah, haven't added extra wraps, you really can't slip that stitch more than two rows. Yeah, so if it's, if, if you, like I've slipped this purple in two rows, and if you're in a place and you're working and you feel like you're supposed to be slipping that purple stitch, like again, like two more rows, I would stop everything and like reevaluate where you are in the pattern. Um, either you're in the wrong place, or you knitted the previous row, two rows with the wrong colors or something. Because um, <clears throat> if you knitted this and stretched it over four rows, I mean, it would really cause it to like really kind of, and maybe that's the thing. Like, is that ever a thing, Claire? Where, like maybe like a, like you want it like a ruching or a puckering like on purpose? Like, I guess it could be a thing. I know patterns that have that sort of effect, but they achieve it in a different way. Yeah. So, I mean, you could, I mean, again, like it could, it could be a real thing, but it, I don't think you're going to come up to it very often. Yeah. Or if fair. you're going to slip the stitch over more than two rows, the pattern will usually have you wrap the yarn twice or even more and then unravel that extra yarn. So there's the slack in there for the stitch to travel up farther. Yeah, that makes sense because you'd have to have a little extra slack to make that, because there's a distance, you know, there's like two stitches might be like a half an inch. So then four stitches are gonna be an inch. Like it's twice, twice as much if you think about it. So um, anything else? Do we wanna see another row of the chart? Um, we do have a somewhat unrelated question. Someone wants to see the slip slip knit. Um, do we want to do that? Do we have time? Uh, we can save that for the last like minute of class. It's not very long. Okay. Um, I did see a question pop up that said somebody, their work is getting very tight. And that is a natural, um, that's what happens. So that's part of slip stitch knitting. Um, it does get tight and it, it, it pushes things this direction a little bit because you are you know, stretching those stitches up so it can um, cause it to be more dense vertically. So going up one or even two needle sizes or even three needles, I mean, who knows, but I'm going up, I would start with going up one needle size and if that doesn't correct it, maybe go up two needle sizes and see. Um, otherwise, like just make sure if your knitting's not normally tight and it is very tight with this technique, that's probably what's going to solve it. Otherwise, um, some things that make your knitting tight is if you're holding your needles like this, you wrap your yarn. 
you wrap your yarn and you make your stitch and then you just kind of hold your stitch here on the point of your needle and let it shape there and knit the next stitch here in this the stitches then by the time they get pushed all the way up there's not enough slack in them to to really fit so they're going to be very very tight so whenever you're knitting it's a good idea to make sure you're shaping your stitches on the fattest part of your needle. So just enter the stitch, put your whole needle through, wrap it, and remember we're trying to manage these side floats, these vertical floats, and then put your whole needle through, wrap it, and then again, put the whole needle through and let it shape there. You don't wanna shape your stitches on the point, and that will help keep it from, and then um, kind of pull this white to pull the slack out of it. Oops, sorry. And so that's how you can avoid, that's a couple of tricks of avoid it being too tight. So now I'm on seven. I did, I didn't need to do two purple. So seven, I do purple, white. So I'm gonna slip the white. Oh shoot, I've dropped a stitch. Pop that back on. And then go purple, white, purple, white, purple, white, purple. It's easy to remember, right? So purple, white, purple, white, purple. See, I'm, because I'm knitting, my natural instinct is to continue entering the stitch the same way as my knit, but you wanna make sure that you're paying attention and you're not letting yourself do that by mistake. While Darren's knitting this purple, last purple. row, I'm gonna put the handout in the chat again in case anybody missed the corrected version. So once you get into the chart, it's pretty easy to stay. So purple, purple, and I have white, purple, white, purple. So entering it as if to pull, white, purple, white. And you're not gonna slip this purple because it's already been slipped. You wanna make sure you're knitting it. White and then purple. All right, so I'm not gonna knit the next row. I'm not gonna work the next row, which would be a pearl row. But again, just remember when you turn it over, you don't even need to look at your chart. Um, you're just gonna, because I'm working with purple, you're gonna knit, you're gonna pearl all the purple and slip all the white. So the row back is super duper easy. Okay, any questions at all? We've got less than a minute. I can't believe I'm finishing on time. That never happens. You proud of me, Claire? I am, yes. <laughs> uh, we do have a good question about um, reading the chart. Um, Andrea wanted to know on the chart, you slip on the black stitches, but that is going to depend on which color you're using, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So as we talked about it, <coughs> excuse me, this first square, this first um, rectangle, or whatever you want to call it, is indicating what color you're working with. So I'm starting here, I'm gonna be knitting, with, you're knitting with black. So you're gonna slip the white, knit with all these black, slip the white, go back across. And then the next row up, the first one is white. So I'm gonna knit the white, knit the white, and then slip the black. So it's, it just depends on, usually it's gonna change every two rows, right? It should alternate every two rows, um, but you're, you'll be slipping both colors, um, in different rows. You won't be slipping both colors in the same row. So as you're practicing, if you do have any questions that you come up on as you're practicing, um, you can feel free to contact me on social media. Um, my screen name on TikTok and Instagram is Mr. Wooly Bear, M-I-S-T-E-R spelled out Wooly Bear. Maybe Claire or somebody will put that in the chat. 
So you can send me a direct message on either Instagram or TikTok. That um, if you want to message me in Facebook, it's just my name spelled out just like normal. So um, just my name on Facebook or Mr. Wooly Bear on Instagram or TikTok. And I do try to answer them as quick as I can. Um, don't hesitate to send me a question. I don't get very many, so I, I really don't mind at all. Um, I hate to think of you out there struggling when I could maybe help you out with a quick little answer. So, all right. Don't forget to practice. Um, don't get frustrated. Um, you know, make yourself a nice cup of tea and try to relax and make it fun. And you know, next week we're going to do uh, crochet in the round, I think. Right, Claire? Yes, we've got crochet in the round next week. And then the week after that, which I think is November, actually, we are going to have some tapestry weaving. Wow, that sounds exciting. All right, thanks for coming to class. Don't forget to practice.